I speak from experience when I tell you how easy it is when you grew up with trauma to go unconscious in relationships. Even though you feel like things are fine and you tell everyone things are fine, a big part of you has left the building. There are a number of reasons this happens, but it's usually a mix of abuse or neglect from the past where you had to learn to deny that you're unsafe and a fear of facing reality in present time because you're terrified of how you will ever live if the relationship that you're in ends. My letter today is from a man I'll call Chris, and he writes, Good morning, Anna. I was with my soon-to-be ex-wife for five years, married for three. Okay, I've got my fairy pencil. I'm going to circle some things I want to come back to on a second reading, but let's read through Chris's letter and see what's going on. He says, all in all, I would say we had a great relationship. We communicated well with each other and outside of normal marriage issues that all couples have, our relationship was fulfilling and happy. However, I now find myself in the position of having been served with divorce papers by her and left feeling blindsided and abandoned. I'm sorry. Okay. For some background about my wife, she is loving, kind, people-pleasing, and generally a sweet person, but has deep, some deep insecurities. The biggest thing is feeling unworthy of love, a fear of abandonment, and that she is unlikable. She grew up in an unstable environment. Her mom was pregnant with her at 18 to a man almost 10 years older than her. This man was an alcoholic, emotionally abusive, and just not a good father. She told me many times how whenever she would have to spend time with him, he just would be drunk and not present with her. Her mom I would describe as anxiously attached. If her mom feels like you are invalidating her, you risk her exploding until she calms down. I knew all this going in, and in the beginning I saw my wife's insecurities come out many times, but I did my best to reassure her, to be present with her, and help her through her struggles, and I was proud of the progress I believe she made over the years. I'd like to add that the last year of our marriage was fairly rough. I struggled with panic attacks, and it was taxing for my spouse. She is a therapist, and I could see she was getting sympathy fatigue. I eventually got on medication and saw a therapist and got to a much better place, but I think some damage was done. I later found my wife was feeling very resentful, but never brought this up to me. She felt guilty for feeling that way while I was struggling, so she kept those feelings in and did not communicate it to me, which I would have gladly talked to her about. And, under, and I would have understood. I know she's human and I completely understand why she felt that way. While I don't think this is the sole reason for her actions, I believe it had a sizable impact on her choice in the following months. Because of this last year, we didn't do a lot outside of the house, definitely in the routine and rut that can happen in a marriage sometimes. Wake up, go to work, come home, hang around. I wasn't too worried about this. I've been married before her, and I know that, that it's a normal part of marriage. My wife, however, has not been in relationships longer than roughly one to two years, so I think she took this more as something very seriously wrong. Anyway, she was looking to go out and make more friends, which I fully supported. She's much more extroverted than I am, and while I still enjoy doing things together with her, I knew it would be good for her to have her own group of friends that she can bond with and have fulfillment with alongside our relationship. Well, with that in mind, a few months ago, she made friends with a social group, and in particular, one man there, and she did a complete 180. She suddenly was being secretive, spending all her time around him, and ultimately began having an affair. She said she loved him and that he loved her, that she wasn't attracted to me anymore, and that she wanted to be divorced, all within one month of meeting him. And this man is cheating on his girlfriend in talking to her, does drugs, is manipulative, and in my opinion, just looking to keep her close as an option, but never his true choice. I tried so hard to work with her, but she was terrified of cutting contact with him and could never give a logical reason for why she was acting how she was. In one of our conversations together, she told me that she had felt unhappy for about a year. The normal routine of married life was getting to her, and she longed for the excitement of what people like this man or previous relationships brought her. I had no idea she felt this way. She never brought that up to me, and she was still showing me love and affection up until she met him. 
She compared him to a previous relationship she had and noticed that they had similar traits, manipulative, toxic, ulterior motives, etc., not unlike her own father, and said to me that, in a weird way, this was more comforting for her than our relationship, which was stable and healthy. Any time I tried to explain I had no ulterior motives, that I just loved her for her, it fell on deaf ears. This all happened over the course of three months until she got an apartment and moved out in month four, and I've not heard or made contact with her in almost two months, coming on month five. I'm heartbroken and devastated. I had no idea my partner felt this way, and I'm struggling to understand how we got here. I haven't been able to rationalize how my wife was able to jump onto someone new that quickly and abandon our marriage so fast. Not to mention for a man who's manipulative, narcissistic, and actively cheating on his own partner and showing my wife this affection. In my own journey of processing all this, I came across terms like quiet borderline personality disorder, CPTSD, etc. In particular, CPTSD consistently seems to resonate, and I'm curious in your experience, does this sound similar? I appreciate any insight you can give in helping me better understand this type of trauma and making sense of this whirlwind of a time I've had. While I don't think any of this is an excuse for her behavior, I know what happened to her as a child is not her fault, and it breaks my heart to see her feel so unlovable and unworthy of kindness when I think she's worthy of love just the way she is. It's a sign from Chris. Okay, Chris, I can help you. This is a very rough situation. I'm so sorry you're going through it. Ah, soon to be ex-wife, you're getting divorced. You were married for three, together for five. And you would say, all in all, you had a great relationship. So Chris, I'm just going to have to say, obviously, you did not have a great relationship. You didn't even know that she was miserable for a year. You were having panic attacks. You didn't mention why. You gave me a huge amount of detail about her and her life and how you researched it and stuff, but there's almost nothing about you and who you are in this and what actually happened. And um, I guess I'm not totally buying the narrative here that you're just like this nice guy who's just always there for her. And, and you know, you this is a healthy relationship, so why is she going off to this terrible guy? I think there's a lot of reasons that it could be, and she's not here to explain to us. So, you know, I can throw a few guesses out there, and I'm sure the people in the comments will have a lot to say. They'll say she's a narcissist, she's a sociopath, she's probably on drugs, she's probably done this before. People will say things, but I'm going to try to be careful about this and just say, my friend, I think you have codependence really bad. And I just automatically feel that it's codependent. When somebody writes in, and they're being absolutely treated like crap by a partner, which you are, Chris. You're being treated very badly. She won't even talk to you. And it happens suddenly, and you're left baffled with kind of a bunch of psychobabble about why it's happening. And um, it is devastating, but what I hear you is you're sort of like doing a... Well, there's a word spiritual bypass when people use spiritual rationales to go, actually, everything's great. I think you're using psychological bypass to go, I'm just this great guy, you know, and this other guy's just this bad guy, and she's doing this thing, and it must be her parents, and I, I've done that, and a whole bunch of people, I get a lot of letters of this nature, too, and, um, and I wanted to share it with everybody, because right now, there's probably hundreds of people who are going to see this video, they're going to hear your situation, and they're going to recognize themselves in it, and I'm just saying, you know, categorically, if your relationship has fallen apart and all you're doing is trying to show up and be the nice person, I'm so nice, but I'm just sitting here and I understand your trauma. You're in denial. It's not just their trauma. It's a decision they made because they were unhappy. And what you're describing, okay, so she probably, it sounds like she has childhood trauma. We all do. That does not mean we're going to treat people like this and just run off. Some of us will, or maybe there's a time when we will. And I'll say, you didn't say how old you are, but in, in the event that you're very young, that you're in your 20s, I would say the possible causes of this could be opened up a little bit more to just like an immature decision to get married when she wasn't ready. 
your hypothesis that it's trauma could be true in that she's going for some guy. I don't know, this thing where she tells you, well, I'm going for him because he's dangerous and he reminds me of so-and-so. That just sounds like a thing you tell a therapist. It doesn't sound real. It sounds like she was going dead inside and this relationship makes her feel alive. Whatever it is, even if it's horrible. And I suspect it will crash and burn. Like relationships that start this way don't tend to be good. She sounds like she entered into a marriage without really knowing herself. But the person who wrote to me is you, Chris. And I think you went into a marriage without really knowing yourself and um, without really knowing her. And what can we do? <laughs> People are a mystery, aren't they? People are a mystery. But can I just say, after what she's done, don't take her back, Chris. Don't angle of it, trying to rationalize this. I know it's hard. But I think it's important to let it in how badly she's treating you, how disrespectfully, how abruptly, how unfair it is to make a vow to somebody to stay with them and then just boom, just leave. I also want to ask you, you know, you didn't tell me, which is telling in itself that you didn't say, why are you having this terrible year of panic attacks and depression? Could it be that part of you did understand that the marriage was on thin ice? and you couldn't really deal with it. I mean, that's a lot why people do have panic attacks and depression. That would certainly be believable. Maybe there was some other thing, but you didn't mention it. Your theory anyway, I don't know if it's true, but like after one year of you not being that much fun, she just like abandoned you, which is not what a marriage is. <laughs> Everybody's gonna be not so fun sometimes in a marriage, that would be normal. Um, so was it something else? Was there some kind of icy silence, some inability to communicate real stuff, a freezeroo going on? I don't know. The fact that you couldn't explain it and that you positioned it's just like you're just a nice guy. Yeah, you had some panic attacks and couldn't really function for a year and you guys never went out of the house, but everything's great. So I want to recommend a book. I, I like to recommend this to men. I haven't done it in a while, but the book No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. It's a really important book and it's for men like you who uh, you know you lose love you can't attract like really great people to be with and a problem that may be going on is that because of the way that you were raised or who knows why there may not even be a past reason you think you have to dance around and be nice i'm so nice i help you with everything you ran out and cheated with this guy you must be in a lot of pain it's trauma let me help you with that i'll i'll help work it out for you that's a nice guy in the bad sense of the word and i'll be honest with you when a guy is using that kind of energy to hold a relationship together, it's not very attractive. It's just not very attractive. And I don't, you know, I really don't want to like put a huge brush on everything. Like there's a, a time and a place to get in there and do something heroic to save a marriage. I know that. And I appreciate all the people who give it a try. But at a certain point with what's happening, I just think that you're not talking rationally about what's actually happening. You're, you're, you're really like sitting up on a perch where like, <laughs> like a little bird going peep, 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 everything's great. It's not great. This is terrible. And it's going to be a big hassle to undo. And I, it sounds like you don't have children. So that helps. It's now officially none of your business who this guy is or whether she's with him or not. Isn't that weird? I know it's weird. It's pretty hard to make that that separation from somebody where all of your business was common business for the longest time and now she's just gone off and she's put up a boundary and she's been like this is my life i'm doing what i want and so this thing where he's narcissistic and he's abusive i just think that it's not in your best interest to put your energy and attention on that or even tell people about it i know that a lot of people do believe i think there it is healthy to talk to somebody about this but and it's fair enough that you told me, so I'm not on your case about that. But just to get better, like you need support. It's you who has trauma now. I don't know what you had in the past, but you've got trauma now. And that's the trouble with relationships with people with CPTSD who aren't healed yet, is that we hurt other people, we give them trauma. And so that's what happened to you. And so I just really wanna encourage you because the sooner you can support yourself in getting through this and <laughs> learning to, um, 
check in with your mind, your awareness of reality, whether for you that's a therapist or a 12-step group, which you would certainly qualify for. In our membership program, you could come in and talk with other people. For, for you, other men, may I say strongly, do this mutual support with men, with, with people who there's no potential for attraction between you. That's where things can really get messy. <laughs> and... Um, and start being honest with another person and allow them to ask you questions. Check out that book. And um, I happen to know that uh, Robert Glover has, I haven't met him yet. I'm gonna reach out to him because I just feel like we should collaborate. But um, he does a bunch of men's retreats and books and workshops online. And he has got a lot of stuff for men to sort of take back their freedom in their life. And a little bit of it, I'm like, ooh, this is not meant for my female eyes. I don't wanna know. <laughs> so to each his own and but check it out if you if you if you want to just get a new perspective there were just so many tidbits in that book and it was recommended to me once and I just couldn't put it down and I recognized so many men I had known in my life and the phenomenon that he was talking about would definitely been have been a relationship ruiner for me it's the guy who gets friend zoned it's that's part of what it is. It's the guy who ends up spending his weekends being helpful, helping you move, helping you do this and that, but not really having a life for himself. So don't be that guy, Chris. Don't be that guy. You be your wild, beautiful, loved and loving self. I encourage you to move on. This relationship, even if, even if it is CPTSD, the fact that she's just in the middle of her acting out right now, she's got a long road ahead of her. First of all, a marriage is a marriage, and so it's always worth a try unless there's abuse, But which is a little borderline here. But I believe that if, you're, if a person has a partner who has CPTSD and they're having these like explosive temper events or they're too sad to carry on or they're putting too much pressure on you, that would be reason enough to leave. If you choose to stay, I think the criteria is, are they working on themselves? I would not buy them books. Don't try to get them to watch my videos. I always tell people like, if you, they go, how do I get my mom to watch this? And I'd be like, send her one video, but chances are 99%. She's not even gonna look at it or she will, and she'll criticize it and you. And, and then what was the point? The biggest thing that you can do to influence other people positively is to get well is to get well and be happy. And I know you're not looking for revenge, but the best revenge is success, to become healthy and whole and to have a happy relationship in your life. Because I can tell you want one and you're worthy of it. But there's this dancing around you're doing, trying to people please and try to get your happiness and security out of somebody else. And sometimes when I talk about codependency, I talk about it in these terms that in a way it's parasitic. I know that's harsh. But it's helpful, I think, to, to think about how devastating it is to get stuck in codependency, which is you take your life force and instead of using it to live your life and have your adventures, you put it all in somebody else and then you try to extract life back out of them. I'll be happy if they will use all this love and energy I give them to change in a way that works for me. It's just not a good model is it? And the person ends up resenting you. It tends to interfere with their ability to grow and become the better version of themselves that they would like to be. And so I really believe that there's a way that you can strongly love a spouse and be with them while allowing them to determine the course of their life and just letting yourself watch how they behave. Now, from where I sit, I'm 10 years married now <laughs> with my husband for 15. So I just remember, you know, the early years were pretty intense. By the time we'd been together as long as you were with your wife, we were just getting married and that didn't fix everything. And I don't think it does for everybody. There's, for me, there was a lot of trauma to come up around being married. There's a lot of, you know, no matter how much we think we escape the cultural idea that, oh, you know, I'm drowning out here in the ocean. If I could just get to the island of marriage, my problems will be solved. And a couple of them are solved. <laughs> like, like somebody lives with you and they're with you and you, you, it's a little cheaper to live. There's a couple things and you get some social status out of it, sort of. But it really doesn't fix the, the, the wound of, of early trauma in your life. And so the, 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 the death of that hope that if you could just get somebody who would marry you, that would go away. You know, it's like, oh, wah, wah. It's not like that. So there's a lot to go through and it comes up. So she's probably going through that. But nonetheless, how she's dealt with that really sucks. 
you know, it's just, it's, it's been very um, dishonest and inconsiderate to you and not, uh, yeah. I just think there's this idea that I hold in my heart that I believe pe people who are married should try to stick it out, but some marriages were not really marriages. And one thing that makes them not really marriages, they're more like friendships, you know, with sex and living together and maybe a mingled bank account, but they're not really a marriage because it, that would be the case if one person was too emotionally mature to really make that level of commitment. That doesn't mean that you just give her 10 years and wait for her. Don't do that. If she really is sorry what she did and goes and works on her trauma, you know, maybe talk to her about it if you're still open to it. But for right now, like, I would say just like, live like, live like a very happy, fun monk for a year. Just clear that romantic clutter out of your life. Get the focus back on you. I just say a monk, like no dating, just for a little while so you can heal and recover and not jump in and bring all that crazy into the next relationship. And have fun, have joy. Uh, start practicing telling the truth. Be in environments where other people tell the truth. And see if your red flag detector and your level of perception can switch back on. You're gonna need that. Now what's happening here is a self-defeating behavior. I was debating, do I give you the, the download on codependency or do I give it on self-defeating behavior? But I'm gonna give the download on self-defeating behavior so that you can just get a sense. These are 16 areas that are common for people who are going through a lot where the things we do ends up working against us. When you, when you read this download, you can keep in mind, do you have any of these? And if so, what's the most important one for you to heal first? And then take a little step towards that. That download is right here, and I will see you very soon.